Before Bitcoin, there were cypherpunks, a loose collective of cryptographers, coders, and digital privacy advocates who saw the internet as a new frontier for freedom. In the 1990s, they warned about surveillance, censorship, and the power of centralized systems. Their response? Build tools that made privacy and decentralization possible by default. They weren't just hobbyists, they were idealists with code. They dreamed of digital cash, anonymous messaging, and distributed power. Bitcoin didn't appear out of nowhere. It was the result of decades of work by these rebels with a cause. Welcome to Plugged In Crypto, your connection to crypto. To the cypherpunks, cryptography wasn't just math, it was a political weapon. They believed privacy was a right and code could protect it better than law. The famous phrase, cypherpunks write code, wasn't a slogan. It was a mission. Tools like PGP encryption, anonymous remailers, and digital pseudonyms weren't science fiction. They were real, working systems that let people speak, trade, and organize without revealing their identity. This mindset, distrust in authority and belief in math, became Bitcoin's DNA. Before Bitcoin, there were many attempts at digital cash, and all of them failed. David Chom's DigiCash in the 1990s was too early and required trust in a central authority. Nick Sabo's BitGold solved many problems but never launched. Wei Dai's B-Money proposed anonymous markets with a shared ledger but lacked implementation. These weren't dead ends, they were stepping stones. Each one solved part of the puzzle, but not the whole thing. In 2008, right after the global financial crisis, a user named Satoshi Nakamoto posted a nine-page white paper on a cypherpunk mailing list. The title? Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. It wasn't just a paper, it was a manifesto. It combined old ideas with new code, solving double spending without a trusted third party. The white paper was elegant, radical, and practical. The cypherpunks instantly understood its implications. This wasn't just a new kind of money, it was a new kind of trust. In January 2009, Satoshi mined the first Bitcoin block, the Genesis block, embedding a message about bank bailouts. It wasn't a coincidence, it was a statement. The old financial system was broken. Bitcoin was the alternative, one that didn't require permission, banks, or borders. Early adopters like Hal Finney ran nodes, mined coins, and helped test the system. The network slowly grew, attracting more cypherpunks, libertarians, coders, and eventually, the world. Today, it's easy to see Bitcoin as a price chart or an investment, but that misses the point. Bitcoin was born from a fight for freedom. The cypherpunks weren't chasing Lambos, they were building tools to resist surveillance, censorship, and centralized control. They gave us the foundation, not just for Bitcoin, but for Web3, privacy tools, and the entire decentralized movement. Their vision still echoes today. Some cypherpunks like Hal Finney helped launch Bitcoin. Others faded into the background. But their fingerprints are everywhere. In Bitcoin's code, in its culture, in the idea that math can replace middlemen, and that protocols, not people, should define rules. Without the cypherpunks, Bitcoin wouldn't exist. And without Bitcoin, their ideas might have stayed fringe. By the time Satoshi arrived, the table was set. The community, the ideas, the failures, they all led here. It's no wonder Bitcoin didn't emerge from a corporation or a government. It emerged from the fringes, from thinkers who wanted to change the world with code. The cypherpunks gave us the blueprints for a new kind of money, but the real revolution didn't begin until one anonymous figure brought it all to life. Next up, who was Satoshi Nakamoto and why they chose to disappear? Subscribe to Plugged In Crypto and stay with us.